Okay, ladies and gents, thanks for coming to class. Uh, you've been listening to the Claptones. Any of you heard of cl the Claptones before? Anybody? No? Oh, you ought to have. Since uh, last year, this um, the Claptones is sort of like a pseudo band. It's actually made of, uh, I think, the DJ or two DJs. And if you've been listening carefully to the tune, it's actually a mashup of a few songs together. They combine different songs, um, old and new. You notice that there was a jet, uh, the jet riff happening while he was singing a different song over it. So they mishmash a lot of stuff. And this is what we call a mashup, all right? This is what you, you might have heard in the radio. You might have commonly heard of it as remixes, like club remixes. You go to a club and you hear a remix. Well, a remix is just taking the lyrics and then putting a different track underneath, a different beat or something. But a mashup is more complex. You can have video mashups, you can have uh, music mashups. In this case, they mixed uh, the jet background with, uh, I forgot what lyric it was, but for, from a different song. So you hear different songs being mixed together. Now, mashup artists are first of all seen as sort of like underground musicians or artists out there. And a lot of record companies, they kind of just put it aside as, okay, you know, as long as they're not selling the music or anything like that, they just kind of close one eye. Okay, so in most cases, like in this case, the Claptones, if you go to their website, you can download an entire album, which in fact consists of two CDs worth of music that they've mashed up together. If you heard the quality, it's pretty impressive. It's very professionally done, all right? And uh, it goes to show that the tools that we need to produce quality media is right here in our hands right now. We all have access to it. Okay, so that's just an example of uh, the Claptones and the mashup. You might have um, done your readings on the American Edit, which was also a mashup. All right. It's just that this, the cut tones is a more recent, uh, critically acclaimed production. All right, uh, that came out last year. Now about Creative Commons and copyright, which is what we've been doing the whole week today, uh, for the past week already. I've been reading through all your blogs, and if you notice, uh, I've left comments on them. If I haven't, it means that either I haven't graded or you're out of my radar or something. So do let me know if I haven't. Uh, great at you. Um, and what I've done is I've actually done a little bit of content analysis on your blogs. I've taken out the main themes on what you felt were ways to accommodate both um, copyright holders or content producers as well as the consumers like yourselves. And so I used this tag cloud up there to illustrate the the ones that were very popular. The bigger one, the ones in bigger font sizes were the ones that were really popular with you guys. So Creative Commons was one of them that was the most popular, and I've also ranked it in order over here, as you can see. So Creative Commons, followed by Public Education on Copyright. That's also valid. That's also true. Third is Encouraging User Ethics. It's partly you do with uh, education as well. Fourth is Commercializing Peer-to-Peer -peer File Sharing Networks. We've seen it done to some extent. It hasn't been very successful, but who knows? That's also very viable since it's very convenient. All right. Fifth one would be lowering prices of media content. We're talking about affordability, market shifting, and so on. Okay, so that's also very valid. The sixth one would be on digital right management. Okay, so it's a more of a technical thing. That is, a lot of you are complaining. Well, if I have the software to do it, if it's so easy to do, why not? Okay, so you'd rather have the software limit you than for you to follow rules and regulations. You'd rather have a technical limitation. So DRM does that. A lot of people don't like DRM though because they don't like the idea of buying something and being limited to using it, let's say, three times or not being able to burn it to a CD or something. So DRM has its pros and cons. Yesterday, Steve Jobs actually made a very interesting announcement. If you go to apple.com, you see it. He made a public statement about DRM. If you read it, he actually says that he hates DRM. And he hates the idea that iTunes does have to have DRM. The only reason why they have it there is to please record companies. And he's pleading with record companies to relinquish DRM. Let people just buy the music, download it, and use it however they want. So he's listening to the people. Okay, I'm not saying that he's a good guy or whatever, but I'm just saying that the whole industry does recognize the idea that DRM isn't a solution. Um, because back in the day, before all these internet downloads came about, we bought CDs and we could copy it as, as we see fit. You know, it's been around and it's been accepted. So he's trying to change the, the paradigm of you know, how, how files are managed online, security and all that. 
Okay, so DRMs are a very big issue and it's hopefully going to change. Last one is the mention of iTunes, which I think for most of you represents the idea of convenience. You don't mind paying for it uh, so long as it's easy to get to. All right? right now, rather than to run to a CD shop and to fork out money or to take out a credit card to pay online, um, you do find it still easier to just go to a website and hit download to download a file. And if music uh, record companies and content producers can make it that easy, then maybe, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. If it was so easy to pay online, then maybe it's not so bad. I'm not sure about over here. Do you guys use PayPal over here? Yeah? Do you buy stuff overseas? Now, I'm curious, lately, especially since last year, I noticed that a lot of people in Singapore were buying things from Amazon and all that. Can you tell me why? What was the main thing? That is it is cheaper to buy abroad? Like, what kind of items? Oh, so things that you are rare here or scarce over here. I thought it was because of V-Post. Do you think that was the cause? Because it was a sudden switch, you know. Last time, you did, I didn't see anybody really buy a lot of things online. Suddenly, there's a surge. Even Amazon realized that, and Amazon now actually has uh, uh, ships to Singapore as well, if you go look on their website. So they realized that VPost was maybe doing something, and hey, we, we, we could just do it directly. Why not, you know? Oh, you have no idea what VPost is? Any of you use VPost a lot over here? No? So you guys talk about VPost, but I never used it. Okay, VPost is the idea of having a virtual post box or a virtual mo mailing address in supposedly any most countries that uh, the Singapore Post Office has, you know, overseas. So for example, if you want a US address, you sign up for a VPost account and they give you a uh, US address. So you can do anything you want with the address. Like for example, if you buy something on Amazon or any online retailer that doesn't ship internationally, you could then send it to that US address and then get, get whatever you want. Theoretically, you could also subscribe to services in the US. Let's say you want to use Vonage, okay? let's say for example, and they only deal in the US area. You could use that mailing address to say that you're living in the States. I don't know, there's just different ways you could use this. Okay, so VPost gives you that virtual address. Um, but back to the story here about, about copyright. So these were the main themes that you guys gave out and I thought that it was pretty uh, um, nice that it's pretty good that all of you explored these different areas. Uh, copyright works, okay, but if you notice, it is very, very stringent. It's very, very, uh, it's, too, it's too regulatory. There's no, there's no granularity to it. Okay, there's no way we can change it as we see fit. If we were to produce anything, it's, if we just choose the copyright, means that you know, it's yours for years and no one else can touch it unless they call you or they pay you. But what if you want to share it? Then you, know, you could put it on public domain, but then everybody would just use it any way they want. What is there an in-between? Okay, that's where Creative Commons comes in. And um, I'll show you some illustrations on how it's used and so on, some examples. Okay? Um, but first of all, I just want to show you something here. So I've updated the award system here, made it more usable. And some of you have already started using it on your blogs, I noticed. So the award system's like this. There's five awards you can get. Uh, the best of the week, there's only going to be one. There's a special mention, which a lot of you can get if you were to do good work. And I'll show you an example of how it's done. Most popular is going to be very rare. Unless one of you actually has your blog post cited in the media, CNN or something, then you get that rare award, okay? And then you have Creative Style, which I'll show you some examples of how some of you have done that. And Early Birds, very simple to get. But if you think about it, someone suggested to me, who, uh, who is that? Uh, what's your name again? You suggested to me over lunch, right? Yeah. Eric. Eric, yeah. We were having uh, papaya or something. Yeah, he was eating so much food, and I thought, you should have seen his, his car, it was filled, he's like two hours, so what, what can I do, I just eat. <laughs> anyway, he, he made a good suggestion, I was thinking about the idea of early bird awards, and I was thinking, what if someone were to just post something crappy then, to get that award? Then I thought to myself, wait a minute, it, it still work, because if the person's going to bring attention to him or herself, it better be good, otherwise it will look rather shameful, right? So, it's a self-correcting, self-adjusting kind of award where 
yeah, sure, you can go get it, but better make sure you look good because if people are going to see what you're writing about, then you know, you better be good. It's kind of like if, if the media is going to interview you, you want to dress well and all that. So I'm just trying to hint at that. Now, surprisingly, ever since I put an early bird award, <coughs> week four, <coughs> where's Pam? She was sick. She was sick, she was sick. <laughs> okay. Nothing wrong there, like, but like I said, there are many awards for you to get and you want to collect the whole set, just like Hello Kitty, okay? You want to get the whole set. Now that I... Yeah, the McDonald's thing, right? Yeah, that was pretty... Uh, but anyway, you don't have to line up for this one. This one I can give free. Uh. Anyway, um, so she's got that, but it doesn't mean that you guys are left out. If you notice here, week three for copyright and creative culture, a lot of awards were given out, okay? And this page, just to let you know, this is the awards page which you can access from the awards site here. And uh, every week, I will update this based on what I've read. And so week three, we have an early bird, yep, okay, he produced an early bird on uh, Pirates of Virtual World. It's actually a very good uh, piece, but he's one blog of the week before, so I'm not gonna give him another one. I'm gonna rotate it a little bit. So blog of the week actually goes to Christabel's Power of the Consumer, well done. Um, she combined the idea of Web 2.0, how Times wrote about the, the person of the year being you, with the idea of copyright. That is actually how copyright needs to be changed because of how consumers now, the way they use information, the way they use media and all that has changed. And how we have the power to also sort of uh, expose or promote certain artists and so on. So she wrote the article pretty well. Um, explained her idea pretty well, so you can take a look at that on your own time. But the rest of you had very interesting uh, pieces as well. In the case of Zawiyas, uh, so, so, yes. oh yeah, I liked the way you had a conversation with your little brother about copyright, and it's amazing how, oh, cannot load, sorry, because I don't have internet access here, it's pretty terrible, I don't know why. Um, but if you go read it, I like the way she interviewed her brother over MSN. And it's amazing how young kids know so much. You know, if you talk to young kids, they know a lot. And they can even suggest, yeah, it needs to be changed. This is what you need to do. So it's pretty interesting if you go read it. Um, so the rest, of, the rest of you, like Faith here, talk about copy left, copy wrong, and so on and so forth. Pretty interesting. Uh, Simin. Yeah, so talked about a bit about gaming and we. Uh, there's this whole phenomenon of people paying for downloading games. So he mirrored that with the idea of downloading music as well, which I thought was pretty good because people do pay for downloading games. And why don't they do it for music? So pretty uh, relevant and so on and so forth. So there's plenty of examples here. You can go read about it. Um, that creative style are, are those that are very weird. Okay, they, they tend to be a little weird. For Lee Rong and Catherine's ones, they're fine. Um, fi if you well, I don't have access here to show you, but they did it in such a way that the color scheme, the way they laid out everything, they had headers, the way they broke down the article was very easy enough for me to read, very easy for me to grade, okay? So some of you had very strange formats on your blog and I couldn't read the words, like white text over white backgrounds, like, whoa! <laughs> it's like, I had, to, I had to highlight the text so that I can decode what you're trying to say. And then some had small fonts and some had pictures of themselves blocking the words. Huh? <laughs> so, so for these people, they just kept it simple and they used very nice colors for me to see properly what's going on. And imagine if it's difficult for me to see and I've got pretty good eyesight here and everything, it's going to be difficult for the public to see as well. So a lot of your work here is going to be very public, public oriented. It has to be public oriented as well. So you got to remember that. Okay. So these were good ones. For Julius, he wrote a very interesting piece. He, it wasn't very... Uh, he wrote from the point of view of why we should love pirates, and some of you actually wrote about that. But he explained it very well in the sense that um, he talked about accessibility, the problem of accessibility in third world countries, about how people in some countries have no have no access to these things anyway. If it were, you know, give, you know, if it were out there, they had no access to it anyway, and possibly running to going to a nearby pirate to just buy the CD gives them access to something that they would never have in the first place. And I thought he explained that concept pretty well, um, which, which is a counterpoint to the idea of copyright, uh, which, which, you know, if you think about copyright, it doesn't seem to work 
it's, it seems to be um, an umbrella law that covers all countries and it doesn't seem to be tweaked enough for every country, you know? Every country has different economic status and so on and so forth. So it ought to be adaptable, but it isn't. It hasn't been adapted yet, okay? So there are many solutions here that are offered. So some of you talked about abolishing copyright altogether and then argued for it and so on. And I then recognized you for that. So for, for him, he gets a Creative Style Award, okay? So yeah, so that's the award system. Uh, just to let you know also, so you, you've got these aggregators here, okay? You can see both the Singapore and the US ones. The US side, they've also written about copyright and they are watching your blogs as well. So if you're free, you can take a look. Here's the US instructor's blog as well. That means this is our, like the instructor blog for Singapore and then there's a US one as well. This is what my friend's doing on his side. So you can see how he gives out his assignments as well. And uh, I don't have access here, but you can take a look. And um, they've started to, to, they didn't use to use a lot of images, but ever since seeing your blogs, they started to put a lot of images as well. So it's pretty interesting who's, uh, I won't say copying who, but who's, who's really competing with who now. So yeah, I was talking to the other uh, lecturers about it. It's fascinating how like, I think maybe the US counterparts, they're saying, wow, these Asian kids can write so well, we better do something, you know? They're, they're frightened already. So anyway, that's that, and uh, today's topic is all about this, and I played for you a little bit of the Claptones, which is a very good uh, uh, bunch of mashup artists. Okay, you're gonna hear a lot about the Claptones in time to come because they're growing, they're becoming really big. Um, in the meantime, these are just some examples of how things are pirated now. Even the holograms are being pirated, the seals and all that, okay? Now, before we go deep into this issue, uh, not too long ago, uh, a few weeks ago, there was this article in the papers that talked about uh, how the Minister of, Minister of Communication Devel Community Development, Youth and Sports wanted Singaporeans to develop the next new YouTube or Skype. And he says, oh, you know, we'll give funding and all that stuff. We'll, we'll promote innovation and all that. And he's asking citizens like yourselves to develop the next big thing, all right? And I wrote why it will never work, all right? Now, I'm not the only one out there. There are plenty of people, okay? Now, he, he spoke about this in, what was this? The World Economic Forum. So he was telling people that he's going to have Singaporeans do this. Now, there's a, there's a bit of a problem about it, okay? First of all, well, you know what? Just to make it easier for you guys to understand, I'm just going to play this clip from Mr. Brown that came out yesterday. Hi, welcome to the Mr. Brown Show. This is Mr. Brown. This is Steve. This is Electrical. Oh, wow. So sterile. Uh. Yeah, yeah, man. Anyway, Vivian Balakrishnan recently uh, exhorted Singaporeans to try to build the next Singapore YouTube man. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Can make a lot of money. We should be, the, we should be trying our best to create our next YouTube. Yeah, you the side of me faster. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jimmy, you know what the Singapore minister said? No? Huh? He said uh, we must be like the US. Uh -huh. We must start our own company like YouTube. Look at this Singapore side. Is the visionary internet legitimate expression organ of Singapore? I think it's version 1. It looks very modern, eh? Huh. Wow, advanced technology, ah! Wow. Hello, welcome to the visionary internet legitimate expression organ of Singapore, or videos. Watch and upload your videos today. Wow, eh, hey, if this is Singapore version of YouTube, or wow, this guy is sure very rich, huh? Eh, hey, see, got what videos, eh? I like to watch Naruto on YouTube, eh, hey, the Singapore organ, ah. Hmm, wait, ah. Eh, hey, don't have, eh? Maybe it's because Singapore don't allow the copyright infringement. Hey, you see the big warning sign in red on the side? No copyright works can be uploaded. I don't believe. Wait, wait. I tried uploading my pitch video. Stop! Stop! Your PC is starting to get fire. You can't let like Singapore YouTube copyright fire warning out. Video is a violation of the Copyright Act. Any further uploading will result in the destruction of your PC. Hey, check out, check out! Wow! Hey! So fierce the copyright protection! Final war is the new friends! I can detect copyright if you want! Hey! Better go and see what else is there to watch, man! I, I, I like to see the crazy stunts, like the people put mentors in the coke and then drink the whole thing. Well, I do a search. Okay. Mentos in coke. 
Diversionary Internet Legitimate Expression Organ of Singapore does not allow videos of dangerous scientific experiments. Please <laughs> watch this video of a man chewing a mentos instead. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, okay. How about look for the video of Chill Girl alone in the room as she's dancing in a sexy way with very too close to some hip hop music? Yeah, okay. I think. Chill Girl dancing very sexy like that in the room alone. Expression organ of Singapore does not allow sexy dancing videos, as they may cause Singapore children to perform obscene acts on camera, get pregnant, and take sweets from strangers. Please watch this video of girls standing hard in her room instead. What now, eh? YouTube got all this kind of thing. How come the Singapore version of YouTube cannot? Uh, how about those uh, comedian like the uh, Carlos Mencias and the Dave Chappelle video? You know, you know, yeah, 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 I love their jokes about white people, man. Hey, and that black American president joke, also very funny. Search, search. The Visionary Internet Legitimate Expression Organ of Singapore does not allow racist humor to be uploaded. Any attempt shall be persecuted under the Sedition Act, and the guilty shall be torn from limb to limb by horses. <laughs> Please watch this minister making a speech about the importance of race relations instead. How the hell so many rules? Hey, like this better don't call it YouTube already lah. Yeah, no, more like, more cute man. <laughs> Actually, you should have known from looking at the page. Hey, you see next to the video clip, what is the big button say? Oh yeah, it say, complain. This cannot, that cannot. What videos are on this video site anyway? Hey. Ask the site what are the popular videos in. Please select from the following. Number one, today in parliament. Number two, minister speeches. And number three, national day parades. <laughs> the Mr. Brown Show was brought to you by mrbrownshow.com. Failures will persecute anybody infringing Mr. Brown's copyright. Okay, this, so that kind of answers the question as to why Singapore will never have a YouTube. Okay, so uh, to uh, the, it's the environment that we're concerned with, and maybe down the road things will lighten up a bit, and maybe we might get access to it. But for now, Singapore will never have their own YouTube. Okay, so that's Mr. Brown for you. And um, while I was doing some research, I found this interesting. Uh, Summary of why Singaporeans resort to P2P, this is in a blogosphere, one of my friends, peer to peer. So, talks about how things like uh, local TV is boring, so they download stuff. Um, anime fans cannot get access to anime, so they download everything. Playboy band, and so on and so forth. So, just, just a sidetrack read there if you're interested. So, I showed you a little bit of the claptones earlier. Um, here's something that is even more dramatic. He was DJ Danger, DJ Danger Mouse. Any of you heard of him before? No? Okay, fine. Okay, DJ Danger Mouse has been around and he's been remixing a lot of things out there. And one of his most ambitious projects came out back in uh, 2004. He had this website called The Grey Album. Okay? And uh, it combined, as you can see, 1968 The Beatles the white album with Jay-Z's The Black Album and so he produced it and called it The Grey Album. Okay? And this video was one of the first few pro professionally done music come video mashups you will ever see and um, when he released it, it was incredible enough that EMI and record companies all started to panic so they wanted to shut him down. So of course with the, with the advent of YouTube, you get to see it today.
So that was one of the first few mashups that really took the world by storm. Wikipedia has an entry on it and explains the whole scenario. If you are uh, into hip hop, rap, and all that, you know that it's really an industry that resamples or samples each other's work a lot. They take old stuff, they take rhythms, beats, lyrics, and they repeat it. They repeat them, sample them, loop them, and so on. So what's happening here is that he's taken, well, obviously copyrighted material. Especially the Beatles are very protective over their stuff, and uh, he's remixed them. This is this is. Uh, I mean, they can take action on him, but he didn't do it for commercial purposes. So after a while, they just let it slide. But as you notice, this is what we call the creative culture, in a sense that we take existing materials out there in popular culture, and then remix them or re-innovate them, and then make them and turn them into something else altogether. Because as I mentioned before, there's no really such thing as an original idea. There's this idea back in, if you study the arts, the idea of intertextuality. That means everything is hyperlinked, or everything is based on something else. Okay, every there's no such thing as original thought. Intertextuality. Okay, you can look it up if you want. Um, so, just for fun, here's another one that was produced more recently, last late last year, and it also, as you if you notice, there'll be a lot of copyright infringements in here, but uh, no action was taken so far. <coughs> What you got against this? So as you notice, as, uh, as time goes on, you start to have more people collaborating and working on these things together, get, and you start to really have really, really complicated, sophisticated kinds of uh, mashups now. Now, um, so you've talked a little bit about mashups and all that, and uh, I thought of bringing to you to attention of Z Frank. Any of you heard of Z Frank before? I, oh, this whole class is all like shake hitch. <laughs> I need some nods. Z Frank is one of the most famous video bloggers around. Okay, he's in the states and all that, and he produces a video blog every day. All right, except for the weekends. And uh, the reason why he's so popular, you'll see in a while. Okay, you 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 see why. It takes you from zero awesome faster than a Taipei bodysuit. You're watching the show with Z Frank. I don't feel so good today. I had to drink a berry and milkshake. And it turns out I don't like barium milkshakes. So let's just play that makes me think of. Bliss Fork writes, do you feel safe drinking your tap water? Not always. Pirate Boy writes, my pillow has a picture of a moose on it. Is that weird? No, unless it wasn't there yesterday. Do you have a tattoo? Yeah, I did my eyeball so I can see my tattoo on everyone else. It's a scorpion. 
and there's hearts. Bianca writes, what do you do when you suddenly become disillusioned with everything that was important to you yesterday? You start working on something that will disillusion you tomorrow. Shadow Schooly writes, what are your thoughts on the creator and the created? You put something out into the world and it becomes not yours. In college, a friend of mine told a group of us about a memory he had from when he was very young. He remembered that after each time he made a poop, he stood there and watched the toilet flush. He would stand there and wave and say, bye-bye, duty. Bye-bye. From then on, we call him Duty Man. Years earlier, Marcel Duchamp gave a talk called The Creative Act to a group of people in Houston, Texas. In his case, however, he was talking about art, not poop. Duchamp argued that the creative act, or making something, involved not only the artist and the art being made, but the spectator as well. That pissed a lot of artists off. He was very interested in the difference between what the artist wanted and what actually <laughs> and what actually happened. He called this difference the personal art coefficient and said it was like a relation between the unexpressed but intended and the unintentionally expressed. After a piece of art has been made, this is the stuff that the artist no longer has control over, but the spectator does. The artist may say, This painting represents man's clinging hope as he slowly descends into the inevitable void. But the spectator may say, Hey, doesn't that kind of look like a spoon? That would look nice in my bathroom. Bye bye, duty. Bye-bye. When Duchamp wrote this in 1957, for most people that made things, spectators weren't that easy to come by. Since then, things have changed a little bit. For many of us that publish words or pictures or videos online, the idea that the audience has a role to play seems very natural. That's why I like 80%. When you're 80% done, you have most of your work behind you. The end is in sight, but you're not done. And you can still hold on to the hope that this one will come out just right. At 80%, I also start to become aware of the spectator. Start to become aware that what I made will soon be in someone else's hands. And in the time that's left, I get ready to flush. Bye-bye, duty. Bye-bye. Okay. So, the creator and the created. The idea. Um, that is, who really owns the idea after once it's produced. Um, this is sort of like a sidetrack to what has been going on, but it also gives us a better grasp as to what we're dealing with, okay? So, I mean, to own an idea in someone's head, once it's spread already, it's just bizarre. But at the same time, that's why if you look at the Copyright Act, it only copyrights the things that are produced, okay? So, I don't know, if you have a great idea and it spreads, well, congrats, but at the same time, it's, you can't copyright it unless you produce something from it, okay? It's just something to add. So, back to the topic of uh, Creative Commons. To explain a little bit about how it works, because of you, a lot of you dabbled in it, a lot of you wrote about it, but might not be exactly clear on how it works. This is uh, just a little bit about it. When you share your creativity, you're enabling people anywhere to use it, learn from it, and be inspired by it. Take the teacher who shapes young minds with work and wisdom from around the globe, and the artist who builds beauty out of bits and pieces she finds online, and the writer whose stories use ideas and images crafted by people you've never even met. These people know that when you share your creative wealth, you can accomplish great things. They and millions of other people all around the planet are working together to build a richer, better, more vibrant culture using Creative Commons. To understand Creative Commons, you need to know a little bit about how copyright works. Did you know that when you create something, anything, from a photograph, to a song, to a drawing, to a film, to a story, you automatically own an all rights reserved copyright to that creativity? That's true. Copyright protects your creativity against uses you don't consent to. But sometimes full copyright is too restrictive. What about when you want all those millions and millions of people out there to use your work without the hassle of coming to you for permission? What if you want your work to be freely shared, reused, and built upon by the rest of the world? Luckily, there's an answer. Creative Commons. We provide free copyright licenses you can use to tell people exactly which parts of your copyright you're happy to give to the public. It's easy. It only takes a minute and it's totally free. Just come to our website and answer a few quick questions like, will you allow commercial uses of your work? And will you allow your work to be modified? Based on your answers, we'll give you a license that clearly communicates what people can and can't do with your creativity. You don't give up your copyright. 
you refine it so it works better for you. Welcome to a new world where collaboration rules. It didn't even exist just a few years ago, but now there are millions and millions of songs, pictures, videos, written works available to share, reuse, and remix, all for free. Want to work together? Then join the Commons, Creative Commons. Okay, at this point, because we don't have the usual COM242 uh, break cheerleaders, I'm going to give you a break of 10 minutes. Okay, come back right, right back after that. Yes, it is. Just a copyright. Um, I want to just clarify a few things here, how, how Creative Commons work. There are four main conditions that you can apply to your creative work, let's say you're a musician or artist or whatsoever, or photographer even. So the first one is attribution. The idea of attribution comes whereby you just have, you put attribution there, you let people use the work however they wish, but uh, they have to credit you for it. Okay, so that's attribution. Now if you're curious, just to let you know, all these things are linked on the blog. Okay, so you can get access to it, and it, this one would be under Spectrum of Rights, and there's another comic called Creative Commons and so on. So, just to give you a little guide on how I'm going to test for exams and stuff, all these things are kind of testable. The video is not so, but this introduction to copyright, which is what you read for your blog, that's testable. And then the little bit about how to differentiate between the different forms of Creative Commons, okay? All right, so back here. So attribution is kind of like just giving credit back. So if someone were to use your picture, in this case this person took a picture of the uh, San Francisco Bridge, he used that picture but make sure that he credits the person back, usually with a link or, or something, okay? And so forth. Then there's the non-commercial version where you, if you attach that right to your picture, anybody can use it, for example in classrooms, but, oh, forgot, but you don't get uh, you can't use it for commercial use. For example, great. There's too many people surfing porn, that's why it's very slow today. Okay, basically, I can skip along actually to give you more idea. Here's a quickie on the Flickr site. Attribution refers to letting people copy, distribute, display, and perform your copyrighted work and derivative. Derivative would mean that any versions of it, any uh, edits of, about it, okay? Anything that you use based on your work, okay? But only if they give you credit. So that's attribution, okay? Then there's non-commercial where you let people copy, distribute, display, perform your work and derivatives based on it, but only for non-commercial use. The next one is no der derivatives, which means that they can do anything they want as long as they make direct copies and not distort it in any way. That means they can't re-edit it or use it in mashups. And the last one is share alike, meaning that if you're going to use this, you also have to apply the same rights that I apply. Okay? Now if you think about it, that means that you want to make sure that this piece of work doesn't get locked in. It's continuously shared. Which if you think about it, if you've done your readings for GIF economy, that's very part and parcel to GIF economy as well. Okay, so these all go hand in hand. Now, just to give you a clear example here, so you've got a musician here, and if she wants to protect her song, she can go to the website, creativecommons.org, and fill out a simple form, and after she does that, she'll get the rights that she can attach to her piece of music, okay? And so, just some other things you can do with it. You can combine some of these rights. Oh. <laughs> you can combine some of these rights, as you've seen here. So you can have attribution, that means always make sure you credit me, combined with non-commercial use, combined with um, no derivatives, that means you can't change it, and so on. So these are just some examples of how people combine some of these things, okay? And then there are some common combinations that you can see on Flickr. Flickr is a photo sharing website, 
Okay, there's a whole social network and community in here. People share photos. So by attribution, so if you, this these bunch of pictures on the top row here would mean that oh, all you need to do is credit me back. You you know you can do whatever you want with it. And then some people they prefer more control, even more control, and so on and so forth. So there's different versions, different things. Okay. Now you might be wondering. Um, what can people do with some of these things? So for example, a blogger, Easy Reloaded. Any of you read Easy, Easy's website, blog? He's like one of the top few bloggers in Singapore. OK, fine. So he was uh, interested in Captain Jack Sparrow. And he was wondering what makes him sexy. And he said, it's his eyes. It's the mascara. OK? So he went about taking all our bloggers' eyes and started doing it. OK? Yeah, he took me too. Yeah, but that's besides the point. So everybody, Mr. Brown, Sia Xue, and everybody. So yeah, I mean, this is sort of like a mini, mini mashup, OK? Sort of. So people can then do what they want with the pictures that they set as, um, you know, for attribution and whatnot. So it means that he has to set, I mean, those pictures have to be non-derivatives. I mean, allowable for derivatives. So you, you know, he would have to pick something in this row or something. All right. Now, so Creative Commons is very popular in the photography domain because it's so easy. You just, pictures are very easy to share, you're very easy to attach the rights to. If you use Flickr, even when you upload the picture, immediately from there you can pick what rights you want already. So when you upload and then it goes there and then all the rights are attached. Okay, so it's very convenient. And uh, we see this also in uh, virtual environments, like in, this, in Second Life, for example. Because in Second Life, unlike the usual games out there, online games, Second Life is a game or a world where you can create items. So people have created clothing, designer labels are very popular in there. People have created vehicles, houses, and so on. And then you can put rights on them. And since they follow Creative Commons, you can also have non-derivatives, whether you allow people to modify them, and so on and so forth. And when you create these items, they're all in 3D. Okay? So you create clothes and all that. So it's pretty fascinating. Okay? So these people, I mean, they are talking. This, this is Lawrence Lissick in Second Life. Okay, and he's just wearing the CC shirt, which doesn't look very pretty, but, but I mean, they were having a, a talk about Creative Commons in Second Life. Now, you might be wondering, so how am I going to find all these things, all these Creative Commons items, you know? How am I going to use it? If I want to do a podcast, a video, or even do a PowerPoint presentation for my class, hint, hint, okay, and you want to find pictures that are legal and whatnot, then you can go to places like CC Search where it searches just for those Creative Commons items. So you can stipulate here whether you want to search for works that you can use for commercial purposes. So you can check that off. And then if you want to make sure that the works allow you to modify, adapt, or build upon, then you also check that off. So in this case, I searched for Apple, as in you know, just generic apples. And I, then you pick a tab like where you want to search. I search on Flickr. And so it pulls up all the apple pies and apples that I can use and reuse any way I want, okay? even commercially. All right, so these are just some examples. So like I said, there's a lot of search on engines out there beyond Google, and there are a lot of hacks that you can use as well, like this example where it taps on the power of Google to use it, taps on the power of Yahoo, Flickr, and so on and so forth. All right? So these are just some examples. and. What have people done with it? More recently, in a case of, uh, for example, a book. This is Lawrence Lessig, if you haven't seen him before. He's the Stanford professor you've read about for Creative Commons. And he's written a, a bunch of books, one of which is called Code. Code is really cool. I've read it, I've used it for my uh, thesis and, and some of my papers before. Because Code talks about how regulatory frameworks kind of look like. He talks about, I have some pictures actually. Let me see if I can just find them. Um, oh crap, there's just too much junk here. I need, I need a mate to clean this up or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me switch back here. There, he talks about four main points that regulate anything, okay? For example, he talks about the market being a force, a regulatory force. So affordability might be for the consumers as well. Okay, so. Uh, markets. Then he talks about law, legal restraints. He talks about uh, two other points which I'm running low of steam on. I can't remember. But he, he talks about the framework okay, in this book. 
And uh, he, in, in, more recently, last year, he wanted to update the book to version 2 to reflect uh, the times, because he wrote that book some time ago. And what happened was that instead of just writing a book himself, he put his book, a draft of it, up as a wiki so that people could go in, fans could go in, and re-edit them, put new information and whatnot. So the book was developed through online cooperation, if you think about it. Okay, and so because it was done as a community effort, he then finalized the text and then he published it. What's happened is that you can buy the book or you can download the entire book as a PDF, which is really awesome. It's a great book. And uh, he's put this as Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike, which means what? What's Attribution Share Alike? Someone explain. <coughs> Attribution, as long as you give him credit and share alike, you're required to share alike. Okay. That means you can't just, you can't change it. You explained it, right? Yeah, okay, okay. That means you can't, ex you can't uh, distort it, you can't uh, re-edit them or anything like that. You have to give it exactly as it is. So yeah, attribution share alike. So you think about it, oh, this is a great topic to test. If I have to give you a bunch of symbols and then you have to decode, what does this mean? Okay, I have to pick what it means. Okay. I'm already cluing you in. It's so easy. You still complain. I don't tell you even better, right? Okay. So this is just an example of a book that was published, all right, using uh, online cooperation and creative commons. And then the last one here is the idea of uh, a swarm of angels, which is a movie project. It's a, a million pound pounds worth of uh, film that they are trying to produce here, and they're inviting people to join in by contributing money or by joining in and becoming uh, a talent. In this case, you heard the Claptones just now. The Claptones have joined in to produce the movie soundtrack. Okay? And so other people are joining in either by donating money or uh, helping with other talents such as scripting the movie, doing the graphics and so on. So I'm not sure where this, so the Claptones are here. I'm not sure where this movie is going, but it's a work in progress and and it's under Creative Commons as well because everybody's contributing, everybody's co collaborating. They want to share the work after that, and so on. So you so you can already see like pieces of the script starting to emerge on the blog, okay? And so people can go in and add things to it or change things and so on. So just an example of how people have started to go beyond Creative Commons and actually make use of these things to collaborate online, which is i.e. part of the gift economy idea. All right, so. That's it for class today. All right, I'm just, I just want you to focus on copyright, Creative Commons, understand the difference and understand how Creative Commons works, okay? It's not about like, high presented, the idea of piracy and all that. Creative Commons is not the idea of piracy, it's so different, okay? So just make sure you know the difference. Okay, that's it. So if any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday at 11.30. Make sure you're on time, otherwise I will leave you behind. <laughs>